once again, good evening. Uh, my name is Natalia Mitriva, and I'm Executive Director of the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters. I'm very excited today to talk about what is new for certified interpreters in 2018. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how to renew this certification for CCHI, uh, what are the new uh, requirements that just came in effect in January. So lots of interesting things, and the way we will work. Uh, first, I will talk about the new things, right? What is um, added to the requirements. And uh, the good thing is well, the uh, parameters that we added or the criteria that we added are optional. So they're not mandatory, but we hope that they will encourage professional growth uh, across uh, the country. Uh, and then I will explain in detail uh, what we define as continuing education and what kind of topics is ex are accepted, uh, what topics qualify as um, performance-based topics, uh, where can you find uh, accredited uh, continuing education topics, and how to document continuing education. After that, uh, I'll actually go into the uh, nitty-gritty of submitting the renewal application. So this would allow those of you who already have done it last month, and I say a couple of you who actually did submit the renewal application last month, you can at this point uh, exit uh, the webinar uh, or hang in to just you know see what um, the new system looks like if you didn't explore it uh, in detail. Um, then I will talk about the national registry that we have online that is connected directly to your CCHI profile and how you can update your profile so your email is available for employers to find you. And uh, of course, as always, uh, I'll encourage you to stay engaged with CCHI. So that's what we're going to do for the next hour or so. And as you know me, I'll try to talk as fast as I can, uh, but um, there will be time for Q&As in the end. So. One of the reasons why there are continuing education requirements uh, is because we want to encourage certified interpreters to grow professionally. And uh, as a certifying entity, we have an obligation to ensure that the skills that you had at the time you passed our certification exams and the knowledge at that time are maintained at the same level further down the road uh, and uh, because the skills were assessed at a certain point in your career at a certain point in time so we need to make sure that two years after you're passing the exam you're still uh, maintaining the skills and knowledge so that's one obligation that we have and for that reason we fulfill that obligation before the public before the consumers of our interpreting services through requiring you to uh, have continuing education and work experience. The other reason, of course, is obvious, like any skill, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. So without practice, skills deteriorate, and we want to make sure that has not happened, because uh, if we say that you are uh, certified, that means that you're able to uh, engage those skills. Um, and lastly, as you know, uh, the exams for uh, core CHI certification and CHI certifications are uh, targeted at the intro level so there is always room to grow and there are a lot of uh, new developments in the profession especially in connection with technology so those are the three main reasons why it is required for uh, we require you to have um, certain uh, to meet certain criteria before we renew your certification so just a reminder of basic facts. Your certification, whether it's core CHI or CHI, Spanish, Arabic, and Mandarin, is valid for four years. So, however, to make it uh, uh, easier and both on you and on us as reviewers, uh, we uh, split these four years into two cycles. But for four years to maintain your certification, you need to complete a certain number of continuing education hours and work, have some interpreting experience or work experience. And the work experience, again, is tied to the fact that we want you to use your skills uh, at a certain level. Uh, 
we track this uh, you meeting these requirements into two cycles years one and two and then years three and four well one of the reason is also we all realize that human nature is to wait till the last moment. So if we would say that you have to submit applications at year four, if you're like me, you will be doing it the night before the application is due, right? So to avoid that, to uh, really be responsible before the public, we split it. So we kind of uh, force you to have it at least some of the uh, continuing education in years one and two, and then in years uh, three and four, making this deterioration of skills and knowledge less noticeable. Um, so what do we require for each two-year period? Uh, 16 hours of continuing education, and that's CE, that's what we abbreviate as. 20 hours of interpreting experience, or we call work experience. Um, the reason we don't always call it work experience, because if you're volunteering, as an interpreter uh, for a patient and a provider, it also counts as your experience. So, but totally for four years, you need to submit two applications, which uh, will document 32 hours of continuing education and 40 hours of work experience. So, let's talk about continuing uh, education uh, requirements first. Uh, the total for two years, as I said, is 16 hours. Out of these 16 hours, at least two hours must be in performance-based topics, and these two hours are required. Uh, again, the reason here is because we want to uh, make sure that the skills are maintained. I noticed that a couple of you lo lose the audio connection. If this happens, try to call in via the phone and connect that way. Uh, we will t and I will explain in detail what performance-based topics are in a second, in a minute. Then, and this is the new thing for this year, is that out of these 16 hours, a maximum of four, or up to four hours, may be earned as non-instructional continuing education activities. So these four hours are optional. You don't have to have it off, uh, uh, but uh, if you are engaged professionally, you can use your professional engagement as part of your uh, continuing, meeting your continuing education requirement. So let's talk about this new concept. First of all, why do we introduce it? Well, as we mature as a profession, we realize that now we have, through CCHI at least, uh, over 3,300 certified interpreters. This is a serious force, and we want the voice of the certified interpreters of you to be heard, and we want you to influence our profession via engagement in professional associations, via developing new standards or uh, or promoting certain important issues for our profession uh, because you have taken the step to get certified, you invested in your career, in your profession, you deserve to influence it directly. And um, as anyone, we know our lives are full of priorities, competing priorities, so we think if we encourage you and reward you for joining an association, for volunteering for an association, for becoming a board member of that association, then we'll see more and more engagement in the profession. And then we will soon see the majority of the professionals uh, engaged directly in its policies and decision making to be certified interpreters, because that's how it should be. Uh, we, I'm not uh, an idealist. I realize that there's still more non-certified interpreters working in this country every day than certified because 3,300 certified CCHI interpreters is just a drop in the sea, but we need to start somewhere and we can be more successful if you get active. So we define non-instructional activities as activities that support our profession, healthcare interpreting profession through volunteerism, leadership, and research. And important thing is 
the healthcare interpreting profession because ultimately uh, the goal of every profession uh, is to be recognized by you know as legally by the Department of Labor, right? And right now, when you look at different statistical reports, you see uh, language professionals combined there, interpreters and translators. So the more we're active as healthcare interpreters, the more there are chances for the Department of Labor of listing us as a profession, like nurses are listed as a profession, right? EMTs are listed as a profession. They're not bunched together as allied health. They do have separation. So it's important that we achieve the same status through our activities. So now I'm going to go into detail of what we mean by volunteerism, leadership, and research. So first of all, as I said, up to four hours could be counted every two-year cycle during your renewal application. Because these activities are not really hours, we call we award points, but one point for non-instructional activity equals one hour of sitting and listening to a training. Uh, however, we will also recognize that it's more time that you spend, for example, uh, working on some on a board of an association than just one point or one hour. Um, the following categories uh, fall into this category of non-instructional. Professional engagement, where we'll, uh, where we'll look at two aspects, being a member of an association and volunteer uh, to uh, causes and projects related to healthcare interpreting. Leadership and um, recognition also has two aspects, either serving on a volunteer board of a healthcare interpreting association or being or receiving a professional award. And then the third category is research and publications, because you all know that's the weakest link in our profession. We don't have many monographs, textbooks, or articles or journals about healthcare medical or medical interpreting. Uh, they're more about translation, they're more about conference interpreting, but very few are about healthcare interpreting. And that is a sign of a profession to have good references, good library. And we hope that this will push uh, certified interpreters, especially younger ones who just graduated from interpreter training programs to engage in this uh, um, with the profession this way. I'll show, I'll uh, let you know where on our website you can find uh, these uh, uh, explanation of all this, but let me just go more in details about each specific category. So when we talk about membership and association, we uh, refer to an association which is uh, healthcare interpreters association or an association where healthcare interpreters rep are represented at a significant as a significant segment. And if you're a member, you earn 0.5 points per year and maximum within two uh, years you can earn two points so again first of all what association right there are many of them like california healthcare interpreters association or um uh Tahit, which is a texas association of healthcare interpreters and translators and you hear here the first time the translators part right but uh they equally represent healthcare interpreting there are ATA uh, chapters and ATA itself, American Translators Association, has interpreters division and medical division. So membership in those associations also counts. Um, National Council on Interpreting Healthcare in healthcare, obviously, even in its name and its mission, has healthcare interpreters at its core. Um, IMIA, International Medical Interpreters Association, even though they're called international, we all know that the uh, significant or most of the membership is represented by the United States interpreters. So, and we have a list on our website of examples. If you're not sure, email us. We'll clarify if uh, this association that you belong to can count, if membership in it can count towards your renewal. Now, how do you count the points? Well, as I said, it's uh, half a point for a year. So for two years, if you're a member, let's say, of CHIA, you get one point, right? But if you're a member of CHIA in a national council, then you earn two points for two years. But if you also add in the membership in some a trans ATA, for example, that becomes three associations, you won't earn more than two points because uh, we recognize uh, that, you know, we want you 
to diversify your talents and do other things uh, beyond membership because membership is a very serious support of the profession but more in a passive way so for that reason that's kind of the lowest amount of points we're awarding the next uh, aspect of professional engagement is actually volunteering and here you will be earning one point per year with a maximum of four points uh, the points are awarded for activities that support and promote the profession uh, through volunteering for different uh, projects, conferences, or courses like creating a registry of a sorts, right? But uh, we do not uh, count, uh, we do not award points for just uh, volunteer activities that do not relate to our profession, right? We all have other volunteering courses. Uh, if they're outside healthcare interpreting, they do not apply. Uh, again, they are awarded per year and you can earn all five po four points uh, in two years for being a volunteer. Um, now here we have an example and uh, the same uh, table is uh, available on our website uh, specifying that uh, some activities get more points than others. If you are a volunteer at the conference and then over healthcare interpreters uh, or educational event, it could be a workshop or uh, a professional uh, um, network event uh, where there is an educational component so then you earn one point for volunteering for volunteering there uh, if you do public speaking about the professional let's say you're a certified interpreter but you also are a parent you go to your kids school and in the eighth grade talk to them how cool it is to be a medical interpreter uh, you also earn one point for that because uh, as our national survey in 2016 showed, our profession is aging. We have fewer younger people entering our profession. So we want to encourage you to talk about uh, the beauty of being a medical interpreter. Uh, then volunteer at the charitable medical missions. Um, in other words, when you perform unpaid work for a medical mission outside the United States, uh, you get two points. Uh, the reason here is usually if you're going on a mission, it's like Doctors Without Borders, etc. Uh, you have to prepare specifically for the subject matter of that mi mission, you know, study terminology. You have to uh, prepare and have the um, uh, know how the group would be working and you have to go through the cultural orientation for the depending on which country you're going to so you need to know how to uh, interact with the uh, patients in that country so in other words you're getting education for which usually before you leave the United States for which usually you don't get any certificates so that's part of preparation for the mission we want to recognize and give you this at least two points uh, for uh, participating in that it's not for the work of you actually interpreting it's for all that training that goes before it volunteer for a project of a professional organization um, you know which is association uh, as we just discussed uh, what here I mean uh, what I mean here uh, is um, when CCHI is looking, for example, for subject matter experts to develop the exam. They are all volunteers, right? Yet they spend hours and hours of uh, helping us do that. Uh, when an association is uh, wants to update their website, they sometimes call on volunteers. Or when an association is organizing a conference and they form a you know, committee of volunteers to help them organize the con conference, you all know there are hours of work going into it, and yet there are no certificates uh, issued. Yet during that time, you are making some serious professional judgments that um, contribute to you being a more thoughtful, more, um, you know, critically poignant interpreter so to say so it is developing your skills not maybe necessarily interpreting from Russian into English but uh, that critical thinking ability and understanding of the profession on a deeper level that's what you're gaining from the experience when you volunteer for a project of any association so for that you're getting uh, two points and if you're a member of the committee of any sort uh, uh, that also you earn as two points so 
what we uh, consider ineligible, in other words, for which you do not get any points at this time, is volunteering free of charge for a patient, right? We all have the situations when somebody calls and says, I have no interpreter, could you come with me? And I know most of us do it, right? For different people, for... So that is not what we call professional engagement. That's our human uh, nature and our human... Uh, I don't want to say a responsibility, but reaction to a person in need. Um, and uh, in general, uh, we, especially if it's a volunteering, not for a patient, but for an organization, uh, it would be better for all of us if we volunteer to for that organization to find funds to pay for interpreters, right? Rather than just donate our hours uh, freely and that organization will never get uh, established interpreting services. So the second category is leadership and recognition. If you're serving on a board, that's where you get the highest number of points, four points per year. Uh, and of course the maximum points is still four points because um, if any of you, and I see a couple of names that I know you're on the board right now of an association, you know how much work it is. Uh, and so we uh, feel that that's uh, where your uh, professional um, integrity, your professional expertise is coming to shine when you are uh, joining the board. And we encourage you to, uh, whenever there is a public call for joining a board, please apply because uh, I personally, that's how I became first on the board of CCHI. I just applied through a public online process and got selected. Believe me, I was ecstatic. And I never knew that I will uh, get to be actually the uh, director, executive director of CCHI. And the second aspect of leadership is recognition. In other words, receiving awards. Right now, we don't have too many awards in, the, uh, in our profession, but we have a couple and we want to make sure that their recipients are duly recognized. And um, uh, right now you earned two points per award uh, and there are four points maximum. So the four um, examples that I can give uh, right away are Chia's Interpreter of the Year, NCIHC Language Access Championship Award, Tahits, which is Texas Star and Language Access Award, and there is a wonderful Tony Windsor Award in Massachusetts, which is not tied into a specific an association, but it's more of the local recognition. So hopefully this will encourage you at a local basis to work together and find ways to recognize those individuals who do a lot beyond the call of being a, an excellent interpreters. Um, and points uh, that are awarded through these um, activities uh, are counting as, as I said earlier, as your hours. Research and publications, uh, here we have different points and different hours depending on the activity. So please, again, pay attention to which activity gains how many, much points. If you are a co-author, you get half a point. In other words, each of you gets half. Uh, if uh, the content must be research-based and educational. And why, uh, that's why we specify what is ineligible. If it is work for marketing purposes, right? Uh, just let's say promoting uh, even in this case like the article if, uh, if I uh, the, the, I wrote for our newsletter CCHI's newsletter about these uh, requirements that's not a research so that will not uh, make me eligible to submit that in my application it has to be research or education a presentation slides won't doesn't count as a publication website comments blogs wiki entries letters to the editor any opinion based articles or anything that is unedited and not reviewed online so i know we have all engaged in social media groups and sometimes it's just pretty lengthy and pretty you know uh, deep discussions but unfortunately that is not considered publication um, so and uh, you can earn up to four points uh, per year uh, for uh, a certain publication and that comes on the next slide um, so if you publish a book or a chapter in a book because we recognize that sometimes publishing a book is not an option but even if it's a chapter then you got four points for that publication uh, if you are a student, got certified, then went back to schools to start your master's, make 
do your master's in healthcare interpreting. You get not only all the good stuff related to becoming a master, but you also get four points towards your certification renewal. If you have an article published in a peer-reviewed professional periodical, that's two points. And if it's non-peer-reviewed, it's one point. Peer-reviewed, let me give you an example of what's non-peer-reviewed. CCHI newsletter is non-peer-reviewed. In other words, we welcome anybody to submit the articles, and it's a staff decision to include them in there's different parameters, but it's uh, even though you know I'm a member of the staff and I do have the background, I'm not reviewing the articles as your uh, peer, as a master, uh, as a interpreter, certified interpreter. I'm reviewing it from the different position, but um, we still would want to award use at least one point for publishing the article in, let's say, CCHI newsletter or Chia's newsletter, whatever other newsletters are there. But if it's an article in a peer-reviewed periodical, in other words, to submit the article, you first have to read the requirements, then it's a committee of peers, meaning experts in the field who vote and accept and uh, submit uh, acceptance then that is peer reviewed and as a certified interpreter when you publish that article when you submit it if it is not clear you'll have to provide a documentation as to prove that this is peer reviewed right now off the top of my head uh, the peer reviewed mostly recognized or known let's say put it this way mostly known in our uh, profession would be ata uh, where a uh, publication, even though it's online, because they have a very rigorous uh, selection process about that. Um, so, and then we also w know that there's still very few resources for interpreters to prepare to become interpreters or further their development. So, if you publish in a performance based support tool like a glossary or a curriculum, and it's available for public doesn't matter for purchase or free of charge, but it is clearly available. It's not like email me and I'll send you one, but it is listed on some you know, downloadable uh, public uh, site. Then you also get a point for that publication. In general, the rule of thumb, if you don't know something, just send us an email to apply apply at cchicertification.org before you upload that activity and actually count it as your hours. But it's pretty straightforward. And I am sure that uh, we won't see tomorrow 100 articles published in peer review publications because there's simply not that many uh, publications. And the waiting period for these publications are about six months. So I think the first uh, we will see will be uh, in a six months period. But we're starting somewhere. So let's talk about continuing education trainings. These were non instructional activities that we equate to continuing education, but they're not really training uh, as is. So what do we accept as continuing education training? First of all, uh, we look at the complexity of that training. Uh, it needs to be beyond beginner level. Um, and uh, when you are choosing a, a course to take to meet your requirements, look for descriptions that say for experienced interpreters, for intermediate or advanced level, or this is a continuing education course. In other words, something that will prompt you that this is not a beginner level course. Um, just to backtrack a little bit, CCHI does not require you to take only CCHI accredited courses as continuing education. If you just follow these you know, guidelines that I'm explaining, you can take any course as long as it meets these guidelines. And it's equally accepted if it falls, follows these guidelines as a continuing accreditation course that is accredited by CCHI. There are advantages to taking accredited courses, and I explain them um, in a minute, but you don't have to always take accredited courses. So what should you avoid? Uh, what would be a giveaway that this is not a this is a beginner level, and in other words, that's something we will not accept. 
if there is description as basic 101 or prepare for your certificate to prepare you for certification or level one in other words something that would be at a very uh, basic level and it's clear from the description or from the title of that uh, training, then I suggest avoid it because chances are they will not be considered continuing education by our reviewers. There are exceptions. Like, for example, if it is 101 on cryosurgery, uh, cryosurgery or terminology related to cryosurgery, cryosurgery is a very advanced topic, right? So we understand that the terminology involved with it would be at advanced level. So the reviewers would probably want, when they look at that title, if that's all you, you submitted, a certificate saying just that title, they will ask you to submit some either handouts or description to confirm that it is continuing education and not beginner level. So the subject matter is important. First of all, it has to be about healthcare interpreting, right? In other words, what, you, what is covered on our exams. The other aspect is, our profession has two words in it, right? Healthcare interpreter. So interpreting is a profession that is not um, that has universal skills across different settings. And for that reason, we accept court interpreting trainings or administrative hearing trainings uh, or conference interpreter trainings that focus on specific interpreting skills, such as consecutive, simultaneous site translation. As far as translation, which is also a skill, we do accept it because in our oral exam we have um, one uh, segment about it, but we limit it because it is only 2% of our uh, exam weight. We limit it to two hours and uh, the topics have to be in healthcare, medical, legal, or healthcare auto insurance subject areas. In other words, if you're attending a presentation about literary translation of the war and peace, it's lovely, but it doesn't uh, won't necessarily help you uh, in your job. But if it is a translation of some um, uh, auto insurance terminology, that may be helpful because you may be dealing with interpreting for a person who suffered uh, an injury and uh, they are at the medical evaluation, which precedes their uh, workers' compensation hearing. So that or a legal case uh, to uh, say how much uh, damage was done to that person. So that intersection of legal and uh, medical is acceptable. But again, it's because it's translation written, in other words, it is only limited to two hours. So as I mentioned earlier, out of the 16 hours every two years, we want to see two hours to be performance-based and uh, to define them. The What we consider performance-based are topics that really engage you in working on your interpreting skills in the three interpreting modes because these are the three modes that you work use daily on the job consecutive simultaneous and site translation so when you choose or plan your continuing education when you go to a conference look for the topics that clearly state that they will have this or abstracts that will state that they will have this elements of practice in consecutive simultaneous or site translation again why as i keep saying without improving and practicing our skills they deteriorate and these skills and keeping them up and listening to others and trying different trainers over the years who teach you the same topics will help our course HI certificates because they have not had the performance exam but yet we want to make sure that they follow the same rules and they're in the same stream and they talk the same jargon as CHI interpreters who have taken the oral performance exams and to help them do that we want them to be immersed and exposed to the skill-based trainings. So what are the examples? Um, something, uh, look for the titles, you know, the more, sim the simpler the title which says simulta simultaneous interpreting in trauma ER or site translation of documents related to genetics. That's no brainer. Yes, take them, you will get your two hours of performance based if the workshop is two hours. If, however, the topic says interpreting in 
organ transplant consult or interpreting in trauma ER without specifying that there's there's no word simultaneous in other words or consecutive or site translation in this subject it is unclear what this workshop will be about or session will be about maybe it will be all about terminology maybe it will all about the cultural aspect maybe it will be about interacting with healthcare team so because it is unclear uh you run the chances that it will may not be accepted uh however i'm not saying never if you will supply a detailed abstract and break down and it will be clear that with the agenda that from this time to this time you actually had consecutive interpreting practice in uh, about organ transplant consult, then it would be accepted. So uh, it's a little harder to make that call when you are, you know, trying to attend that event. Um, so on our end, when we work with trainers, we encourage them to make their titles more explicit and their descriptions again more explicit, so that they clarify. Let's say there is a three-hour workshop. Out of that, one hour will be about terminology, but two hours will be about practicing that terminology through consecutive and simultaneous mode then you get your two hours of performance based in that workshop or whichever way the hours split uh, so we're working on our end with trainers but you also if you would request trainers more to be that specific I think we'll see the results and it will be easier for all of us to decide whether uh, this training qualifies as performance based or not we also now understand, since not everybody lives in uh, a state where continuing education is readily available, but yet everybody by now has either a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop, or their kids have them, right? Uh, so we offer uh, about six hours of continuing education performance-based training via our free webinars every year. Um, where uh, Usually they happen starting in the second half of the year. That's the nature of how the workflow goes within the organization. So uh, we will try to do one at the end of spring and then end of summer and then the fall is uh, the time when we get more continuing education webinars. Um, we're not a training entity, so we don't actually develop them uh, the, these trainings themselves. What we do is we invite trainers. And uh, yes, I am also sometimes invited because in my previous life and by trade, I am a trainer and instructor, and I worked both in Russia at a university, in the United States at a uh, university. So it is still my passion. And when I am doing the training, uh, webinar trainings of continuing education nature for CCHI, I am a guest presenter too. Kind of, you know, like all of us wearing different hats here. So with that said, let's talk about conferences, especially that now with spring, we have a wonderful uh, slate of conferences approaching. The first one is CHEER on March 2nd in California, and then there are many, many more this year than last year even. So we, as a rule, don't approve whole conferences. And what I mean by as a rule is, Many conferences nowadays have several parallel tracks, right? You have a track for this, a track for that. So uh, in other words, you're not in the same room for six hours. And for that reason, we don't approve the whole conference unless, and this year we actually do have a couple of conferences, which is which are just one track. Everybody is in the same room. Nobody makes any choices. They listen to the program, and that conference does have six hour pr pr uh, approved. But as a rule, we approve individual sessions uh, based on the criteria I just described: their topic and their level of difficulty. Uh, and it is important when you go to a conference, first of all, you look in the program to see what you think will be continuing education for you and what would be what or if the conference is accredited, which sessions you need to go to. And when you're in the session, get documentation that you attended that session. Different conferences handle this differently. Some conferences give you kind of a blank uh, sheet which lists all accredited sessions and all you need is just collect either a signature of presenter or uh, a code that is given away by the presenter at the end of the session other conferences give you a different document that you do others require you to scan something so 
multiple ways of doing it. Bottom line, if you have a program, if they if the conference doesn't give out print out con uh, program, print it out yourself before you go, and on that program highlight the sessions you want to go to, put your name on top, and at the end of the session go to the presenter and have them sign it. This way, that's your plan B, right? Plan A, conference organizers will take care of you. Plan B, you will take care of yourself if for any reason that doesn't work out. And then you'll have the documentation. Uh, we also do have, and I'll talk about documents in, uh, at the end, is a template online. You can feel free to download and print those out, but those are a little easier to forget at home than a conference program. Uh, when we count hours, uh, and that's where it gets tricky about how many hours you think we, you got and how, when the reviewers tell you how many hours you actually uh, got accepted, is we count only direct instructional hours. So if the conference is from 8 to 5, not all these 8 to 5 hours will be counted. We will subtract the welcome, the breaks, the lunch, and if there is any quiz, that would be all subtracted. We keep only direct hours that you received education. Also, uh, I know it sounds a little um, maybe childish, but we accept only formal instructional hours. And by formal, I mean somebody has to teach you. Self-study is not accepted as continuing education. I love to read. I live, read lots of things, and uh, that's good. And I encourage everybody to do it, but that is not continuing education that could be verified. Same thing about meeting for a specific purpose at on the job, which is not an educational meeting. So we do accept online training, obviously, in this day and age. Uh, it's important. Uh, make sure that you have the certificate of completion or certificate of attendance, not just a webinar registration email or a thank you for attending the webinar. That does not qualify as a verification document because you can may register and never attend, or you may turn on webinar, something happened, you left it on and did your job. So again, certificate of completing uh, or attending a webinar from the webinar organizers or in any online module, there has to be at the end a certificate giving uh, recognizing your um, uh, participation. We accept uh, in-service activity by healthcare providers or organizations. So if you're a staff interpreter, please utilize your hospital's resources. Uh, Trainings done for nurses about patients say, or doctors, patient safety, HIPAA, I misspelled HIPAA again, medical specialties. All that is helpful because that makes us closer members of medical team. They see you more often uh, at their own trainings, and that uh, also contributes to your development development as an interpreter. And of course, we accept all programs that are we accredit. Uh, and we have a continuing education accreditation program, CAP, that is uh, available at our uh, website, ceapcchi.org. Um, and uh, if you take any of those programs listed there, then you're guaranteed 100%. So back to that comment that I made earlier, that we don't require you to take only CAP accredited programs, but they give you the assurance that you don't have to worry whether how many hours or whether it's accepted or not. Uh, so it's just smoother and easier, but you don't have to do them. However, we put trainers through a rigorous selection process when we accredit these trainings because we want to make sure you get a best training and uh, trainers renew their accreditation. They may choose not to renew it or we may choose not to renew it if we, you know, attended their training and, decide, and discovered that it doesn't really uh, meet our criteria. Um, so how do you find these accredited trainings? If you go to our website, cchicertification.org, on any page, there is this on the right, there is this panel with many different wonderful announcements. But the third button from the 
top is called find an accredited continuing education program you click on that button and you get taken to that cappchi.org website where we have this registry of accredited programs you can do searches by all these parameters for example you decide to do a search by subject matter because you want to find your performance based trainings do interpret consecutively you click filter and you get a return you also can obviously search for by delivery method be it online if you want to do it from your home or if you're looking for conferences you can select conference and then click filter and uh, do the search what we know is that some in hospitals have this feature filtering feature blocked uh, we really don't understand why because you know it's not a threat but uh, if you use uh, if you're in a hospital that blocks that search function uh, either do it from your home computer or from your personal device from your smartphone there you will be able to do that search and so if we for example clicked on that conferences there will be a list of conferences that are accredited some conferences accredit each session as one of this listing but this is an example of a conference that's coming up in Florida this year, Spring into Action 2018, that actually has all the sessions that are accredited listed here, right? So it's easier for you this way to find which sessions you need to go to. And here it has in brackets, let's see, like for example, what I'm highlighting right now, oops, I'm sorry, 3 PBC hours means that three performance-based continuing education hours, and that's called advanced uh, interpreting advanced skills building workshop, right? Oh, consecutive interpreting. So it's no brainer, that's why it's performance based. So some conferences have the listings like that, that makes it easier for you to find them. We also have our own online uh, training portal uh, at a different uh, web address and that one is HTTP without the WWs, just HTTP CCHI interpreters.org. Uh, what you need to do is you create their free account. You do it by clicking on any of the titles that you see on the homepage there of the course. Uh, then please remember your username and password, write it down because it's amazing how many times a day we get requests, oh, I forgot my password and what it happens is they actually forgot what username they created. Either you use your email address or your first name or last name, whichever, something easier, don't get too creative because then you'll forget it or write it down. This is, you're not putting any credit card numbers here. It's okay if somebody will see your uh, login info, I'm joking, but seriously, uh, remember your uh, username because it is different than the username to your CCHI profile. These are different websites, they don't, uh, talk to each other uh, and it's done intentionally also for security reasons so when you created that account you have to log in well the login is in the top left right about our login a very small font so yes it's hard to find but hopefully that's why I'm showing you this, this screenshot so you click on login you log in remembering your password and there uh, you will see a page with different titles. You can click on any title to purchase. Normally they are $10. Occasionally we put them for free. We'll then explain how it is to get your free thing. Um, uh, if you already have one course, you took it. So what will happen when you log in, you log in and you see my courses first so to find any new ones you have to scroll down to the very bottom of the page and click on a very small print saying all courses this is what it looks like you see that's what you look i logged in here is nata m i already took this three practice exams so they're here right now as my courses so and that's all i see so you have to go to the very bottom all course or do a search here if you know the webinar you're trying to find uh, that was recorded and here you will then find and you click on the title or on the image and you uh, are able to enroll so that's another way for you to find accredited all the um, trainings other than practice exams obviously because they're meant for candidates before they get certified so all the courses that are here they are already automatically accredited by CCHI uh, and usually when we 
provide free webinars live. Uh, we record them and then we convert them to these training modules because you have to listen to the webinar, take the quiz, read something. So there's a little bit more work uh, uh, because you missed the live presentation of the webinar, but we still keep you engaged through that. So how do you document continuing education? I know already some questions were showing there. Well, first of all, it's common sense. It doesn't matter what it looks like, but what does matter is what's in that document. It could be a certificate, it could be a letter, anything, but it has to have your name and your full name, not just Nata M like I logged in, right? That was a bad login name on my part because Nata M could be many people, not just Natalia Mitreva. So your name should be there. The topic or a name of the event, in other words, it should be clearly stating what it is. The name of the training entity organization, be it an association or a training provider, doesn't matter, or an individual, has to be clearly stated uh, who delivered that course, the dates. And this is what we usually get. Now we're getting into details, which sometimes the certificates don't list, and you make sure that you find them before you leave that training. How many hours were there? It has to state there. Uh, and the document must be really official. It must be either on the letterhead or have the event organized instructor's name or sig signature. If it's electronic, it should have some kind of parameters that will allow us to search online and confirm that this thing existed. Otherwise, we all are very creative. We can write and create many different beautiful papers that mean nothing. So we really don't want uh, uh, you to be uh, caught by um, some online co courses that really don't provide good documentation. So make sure you have good documentation for uh, your attendance. Uh, it could be certificate, it could be conference program, as long as there is a present a signature next to that session, a roster of attendees of, let's say, seminar that is delivered at your place of work for during lunchtime, which is signed by your supervisor. Um, or it could be your supervisor writing that we held a monthly meeting of interpreters and during this meeting we discussed this topic. That's fine too, as long as there is the address, email address of that person, the name of that organization that we can confirm because these events are not online, right? Uh, so we need to then contact them when we do our audits to confirm that uh, they happened. If you're printing out something, printing out, I mean saving as JPEG or uh, PDF, some electronic system, uh, make sure that in that screenshot there is your name. Uh, and it's clear how many hours that training was because uh, and uh, what date because some colleges and medical provider training systems don't have that uh, then get your supervisor to verify that in an email again naming you such and such did take that online course that they want to submit to you so that's uh, important and as I mentioned we have a template on our website which you can download so what are the requirements for trainers? Because if you're a trainer yourself, you need to you use that training that you delivered uh, as continuing education. But make sure that the topics are beyond beginner level. In other words, what we require of attendees, the same applies to trainers. Uh, so if you're a trainer of bridging the gap, that's wonderful, but that doesn't uh, qualify as uh, big, uh, uh, continuing education. Uh, only instructional hours. I'm a trainer myself. It takes me five hours to prepare 15 minutes of conversation. So only 15 minutes would be counted of the actual time I am instructing the students, not five hours that I spent preparing for that uh, presentation. Um, and to uh, prove uh, that you delivered that training, you have to provide two kinds of documents scanned as one file, because in our application, you can only upload one file, but the state, the, uh, the document should be um, some kind of proof that that activity happened. In other words, it could be conference schedule with your name there or a 
certificate of uh, uh, recognition from the conference organizers. Thank you for doing this presentation for us, that kind of stuff. Um, and then proof of your training experience, because uh, we want to make sure that trainers uh, who are getting continuing education from us actually are qualified to be trainers, right? Uh, as interpreters, we always say you cannot be just a bilingual. You need to have more training to become an interpreter. Uh, same thing with trainers. You cannot be just an interpreter to be an interpreter trainer. You have to know basics of adult education, of curriculum development, of transfer of knowledge, all these things. So for that reason, we want to uh, see that if either through experience, because if you have at least 40 hours of training interpreters, that means people survived to you, your training for 40 hours, right? And 40 hours could be in other training. So if not all, it was court interpreters or you taught as a teacher at a language school. Uh, for many trainers, it's very easy because you're working at colleges. So no brainer that uh, you don't need to show us 80 hours. Just your uh, contract at that college would be enough. So this is the moment where I end the conceptual part of the webinar and go into the nitty gritty of the application. So if you submitted your application yesterday, you may go and have the rest of the evening free. But if you have never submitted the application or if you submitted your application about two years ago, please stay because we had some updates on our online system and it looks slightly different than it looked two years ago. So, one thing to remember is because we count hours in two cycles, uh, I mean, sorry, we accept the uh, proof of meeting the requirements in two year cycles, you need to make sure that you have two applications and for each would document both your continuing education and work experience. Um, each application must be submitted online. We do not accept any paper applications. I'm sorry, went direct direction. Each application costs $150. And you may submit these applications either consecutively or simultaneously, right? Consecutively means at year two, you submit your application and pay $150. At year four, you submit your second application, pay another $150. If you want to do it simultaneously, you're waiting till year four and then you submit both of them and pay $300. Quick checklists before you start the application, make sure you have on hand PDFs or JPEGs of documents that prove that you have for each application for each of two years, 20 hours of work, two hours of performance-based training and 14 hours of other continuing education training. And as I explained this in the beginning, out of this 14 hours, four could be non-instructional and then 10 could be instructional. Uh, but in other than performance based. Um, the key to remember here, if you took a workshop on, con on let's say, consecutive interpreting, and it was all 16 hours, you are done. You don't need to do anything else. But if you took a workshop which was 16 hours about medical terminology, you still have to find a two hour workshop that meets that performance based criteria. Or if it was a 10 hour workshop on ethics, you still need to search for other hours, at least two hours for performance based. So that's why the math, math wise, I suggest you just break in your mind that two hours have to be simul consecutive for site translation and then 14 hours could be anything else. So um, why is it not good to procrastinate and not wait to year four to submit two applications? Well, first of all, that you may actually find that you don't have 16 hours for the first two years and they already passed. And so what happens then, you will not be able physically to put online uh, something uh, that didn't belong, uh, that doesn't belong in those two years. In other words, if you had the first two years, you had 14 hours and then the next year you had 24 hours, right? That won't allow, the system won't allow you to count all together. No, you have to have 16 hours in the years one and two and 16 hours in the years two, three and four. The other thing is you, when the reviewers review your first application for years one and two, 
if they find that you don't have enough hours or if you thought that these two hours are performance based but they actually are knowledge based um, and you appealed and everything but the decision still stand stood then you will be given a grace period to complete it because you're still validly certified till year four right so you still have that time to add up and then you will finish that year uh, to uh, mark. However, if you wait till year four and this happens, you cannot get a grace period for what happened two years ago. So that's why we encourage you to submit applications consecutively. Um, documentation. Really, whenever you take a course or do a, a non-instructional activity, as soon as it's completed and you get a documentation, log into your CCHI account profile and upload it right there. Then if you lose your paper, it is there saved and you don't need to do anything. Then at the time when you need to you know, actually pay for the application, you have everything there and it'll take you five, minute, five seconds or five minutes to review and submit it. So do it as it happens. You're at a conference, you're done with the session, at lunchtime take a picture with your smartphone and on the smartphone upload it to that application. You can access it uh, now um, the, with the new upgrade that uh, section of our um, portal that application site is fully mobile friendly so you can just upload it directly uh, work with it directly on your home on your phone um, same thing with the work hours if you're a staff interpreter that's easy but if you're a contract interpreter in a language of lesser diffusion as soon as you hit your first 20 hours and you have documentation we don't require you to upload that documentation but take a picture of it save it somewhere safe and then check that mark on your application so you don't have to worry about it later. So when do you do it? As soon as you have all the hours, you don't need to wait to the expiration date. Uh, what happens if you submit earlier, you won't get the certificate until your certification expires, right? But, and it won't move any earlier, so you still maintain the same four hours and the date of your renewal is always the date when you passed the exam. So uh, that date doesn't move regardless of what extensions or waivers you may get for different reasons. So it always will be the same. Um, so um, each of you have what we call a CCHI profile or CCHI account. That's that section where uh, on our website uh, on the uh, right that first button says log into your account. That's where you log into the portal and it's listed in the registry and uh, it also um, shows your certification renewal steps. So you can get to it from another place on the website. If you go to website, click on the tab CCHI community and they select certified interpreters or from the footer first bullet certified interpreters, you get to this landing page and you can also click here, log into your profile. When you log in, Obviously, it's very simple. And what you uh, get, you get to your application screen. You find on the screen, there are many different tabs there, but find the screen My Application if it's not open by default. Most of the time, by default, you are taken to the current application that needs your attention. But if at some point you navigate it away from it, you'll be taken to a different screen, maybe taken to a different screen. But whenever you click on this tab, My Applications, you will get this listing of what is uh, ready for you. And the important thing is to pay attention to the years. Let's say, for example, uh, and I played a little bit with my own account, so just for full disclosure here, I whited out certain things and uh, changed them for the purpose of this PowerPoint. So let's say my years one and two uh, started on January 15, 2017, and they will end on 2019, because today is February 7th, 2018, that's the only application available to me and I can click continue and that's how I will start my renewal application for years one and two. Years three and four is not available yet. It is locked uh, and that's what says here. It becomes unlocked at the night of 
January 15th, 2019. That's when that switch happens and both applications are available to you. So here is another example where my years, what uh, one and two, that's the real application now. Uh, my uh, cycle for years one and two is from January 15th, 2015 to 2017 and the years three and four is from 17 to 19 because now it's 2018 both applications are equally available to me and for that reason I need to pay attention and make sure that I start and complete first this year one and two and only then year three and four I know it sounds confusing but my point is just try to read the dates and they will tell you which application you should do first um, both applications look exactly the same, and they have these segments where you will need to put your interpreting experience, continuing education, statement of understanding, and then submit it. The little hint, if things are in blue, that means you didn't meet the requirement. If things turn green, then you meet the requirement. And the action button are orange. The gray ones mean that you didn't fill out something, and that's why the button stays green gray and you cannot press it nothing happens when it turns orange then you can take an action so we'll start with work experience you click on the button add my uh, interpreting experience and the first thing uh, pops up is whether you were an employee contract or volunteer it doesn't matter which one you select which you are and then you put this next pop-up window tells you company name best hospital title you can put interpreter russian lead interpreter whatever it is how many hours you put there and then you select from this drop down yes i have at least 20 hours and then you click here add this activity and as you, as i said earlier because you added your 20 hours that's all we needed that header turns green now the next step is your continuing education I advise you to read what is here. Like you can see that little uh, show less instructions. By default, they are all opened up. And if you are close, just click on that button and they will open up. And they'll have this explanation. They have the link you can click and read more. They have all this good stuff. So we put it here for a reason, as a reminder. If you forgot all this, uh, you know, this webinar or didn't have the chance to uh, read the uh, candidate's handbook. So it's all here in the application. So read these instructions. Then you click Add Continuing Education, and another pop up asks you to select what top subject area it was about don't worry about it too much because uh, I know there are many trainings which are everything or intersect to have two things there you can click just other that's why it's there for a reason if it is not a straightforward uh, selection and then there is a very detailed again with some instructions above it um, uh, application which puts your name right here is ethical dilemmas in pediatrics is this performance based training this is what's important that's how we track your two hours that's required you choose yes or no depending on what it is then the name or of the organization or instant or instructor like in this case I put ATA is it pre-approved I put yes then it will ask you for your role if you're attendee or instructor how many hours and the date of you started the training and ended the training if it was a one day event or one hour event it will be the same date but there are courses which are take multiple days but all these dates must be within the same period two-year cycle that the application is for if you're even one day later you uh, will the system won't accept it so if most of the hours you earned within this um, uh, cycle uh, but the training ended like two days later just make the date shorter uh, but uh, you attribute it to this cycle. Then there is a button for you to upload the certificate. Again, we accept PDFs and uh, JPEGs as the documents. And when you hit in and you see that it's successfully uploaded, you will see the name of your uh, file listed right here. And then uh, you click uh, submit and that gets attributed the next section is statement of understanding when you click review 
I do encourage you to read what you're committing to because uh, by clicking, selecting here, I agree, yes, and then click complete statement, you are become you can you confirm that you will abide with CCHI policies, but also with the code of ethics of a and best national practice of healthcare interpreters. Right here, I agree to abide by blah blah blah. So it's important that you know that you are could against you could be filed some disciplinary actions if you violate the code of ethics that's what you are signing here and because you completed it it also turns green and the last thing is to submit and you see it's gray it means that something didn't get filled out what is it you need to go above and see what happened and most of the time is if you didn't select that performance-based training this bar is not green so this one has all uh, you know 16 hours but this one is not so what you need to go is either go back to the training that you added if because you forgot it was performance based or add a different training that is performance based and select yes here and if it is two hours then that bar will turn green and what happened is this button submit application becomes orange you click submit and you're taken to the pop-up with the payment of the fees now we have two options the main option for you is click pay fees this button if your employer already mailed us a check then and that's what's explained here in this thing here then you choose employer payment instructions because we allow it for people who already know that employer pays for them and there are quite a number of hospitals you actually will be surprised how many uh, that are paying for renewal of applications of their staff so you put their name the name let's say best hospital the contact name their email address we're not emailing anybody we are waiting for the check to come when the check comes when the record record employers payment so if nobody is paying for you, you cl click pay fees and you're taken to the normal standard uh, credit card payment. Look, what I want to specify is for security reasons, none of this information is stored in CCHI. It looks like a payment from CCHI, but it's a direct PayPal checkout. So we don't store your credit card information for a second. It goes directly to check, uh, to PayPal, and that's how we receive your payment. Um, and then uh, if you, however, are lucky and your, and your employer does pay for your renewal, then you fill out this application, you know, that uh, information, you click employer payment, and all these warnings pop up they pop up so just to trigger your thinking again did they really are you sure the employer is paying if you are paying yourself you just did it by mistake just click back pay fees and you'll get to that screen but if the employer is paying then you just click again employer payment and you have to sit and wait until they mail us the check and we will then attribute it and you will get an email notification from us that your employer has paid your fee uh, it takes in um, practice anywhere between two to eight to twelve weeks if this is employer payment so if you're really in a rush and if you didn't you know i would suggest pay yourself and then submit it as reimbursement if it's possible anyway so what happens after you submit is your status here in that list of your application changes to your application is now under review and uh, as soon as it is reviewed I mean as soon as it is submitted you will get from us an email saying thank you for your CCHA renewal application if you're a person with Gmail account, a Hotmail account, this email may end up in your promotional folder, on your spam folder, or if you used your employer email address, a hospital email address, then most likely it will be bounced even before it reaches you through the firewalls. So for that reason, we always encourage you to just log into your account, go to my communications tab, and there 
all the emails we ever sent to you. You can see here a credible number of pages. That's not how many we sent. It's just my account, and uh, because I um, am an administrator, have administrator rights, every email sent to everybody is stored there as a backup. So uh, you will just have maybe 10 emails total throughout the uh, career. So the important thing is to remember that the information you have in that account could be available to potential employers. First of all, we are required to provide verification of your status. So your name and your certification is always public. However, your email address is not. And so when people want to find who is certified or verify that you, in fact, are certified, they go to our interpreter registry online, and that's our second button from the home page takes them to this screen and they can either click on interpreter registry up here or at the button here as credential verification and I did a search here for state of California today for CHI candidates and I just cut off at the first four people out of the first four only one chose to have their email displayed meaning probably that this person is available for hire and wants to be contacted the other three chose not to by default to um, you know, protect your privacy. By default, the email is not available. However, if you're a freelancer who is looking for a job, you really want to have your email available here. How do you do that? So when you log in, usually this is kind of the default page right now after the upgrade. So you have this information here about my account. Here is actually that communication step with the emails we sent to you. Here are the applications that currently need your attention. Like for me here, as you see, it's, again, it's my account. Uh, my years one and two, I have everything, I just didn't pay for it yet. So that's why it's here. As soon as I pay for it, this will disappear from here. For years three and four, I have interpreting experience, a statement of understanding, but I, don't have, I haven't completed my continuing education yet. So this is for you the indication what you're working on. But you need to go to my account tab here in the right top corner uh, and it, when you click there, it takes you to your profile thing. You look, you can see different things here. I blocked out some for obvious reasons, but what you are looking for is your status. And this is the icon that shows that you can edit your status. Some things you cannot edit. For example, your name. If you have a name change, you have to email us at apply at cchicertification.org and with the documentation like new marriage uh, certificate or divorce certificate or any other kind of name change and then we will change it for you because again it's our public responsibility to verify your identity as a certified interpreter so you cannot change your name but you can change your status as far as what shows in the uh, registry so this is the edit icon with a little pencil here and in uh, this um, uh, section you need to make sure that you check this make contact available and then you click save and that's how your email is displayed in our registry. You also can change other things like your phone number if it changed or add a second phone number, email address. Again, we have your primary email address is the one you created the first application and before you got certified, right? But if you want to change it, you can, or you can add a second email address. I strongly encourage you to have your in personal email address as your primary one, not your employer ones, because believe me, we do change jobs and you don't want to lose contact with us because all the notifications go to your primary email, not to your secondary email. And you can change your home address too. Um, and here you can also check when is your dates for expiration of your certification. Um, and before I go to questions, I want to remind you that we want to engage uh, with us on our social media from our website, 
click on uh, these social media icons. We also have an Instagram account, which has the handle CCHI Certify. So follow us, see all our announcements. Uh, you can subscribe to our newsletter. If you click subscribe here at the footer or from Stay Informed, click on the subscribe action. And you also, this is from the same tab, you can find the webinars when you uh, click on Stay Informed, you get to the page which allows you to see what are the upcoming webinars. Um, a couple, of, I mean, an email I want to share with you is of our uh, Operate, Director of Operations, Malika Sadi Goodman, uh, who uh, oversees review of uh, renewal applications and the regional applications as well. So uh, feel free to contact her directly at CMS Specialist at cchicertification.org. Or again, if you send the in email to apply at cchicertification.org, you'll always get uh, that response. With that, let me go to the questions.